So the neuro exam, what, are, what do we do with the neuro exam? We are doing a neuro exam, right? Checking level of consciousness. Okay. <laughs> um. oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm listening. Perla. Perla. What else? Glasgow's Cone Scale. Glasgow's Cone Scale. What's a good score? 18 or better, isn't it? Or is it other way? According to your book, what's a good score? Oh, At least 15. Glass code coma scale. What's a good score for a pediatric client? 15. 15. 15. If you read. Yeah, 15 is a good score. Less than 8. What? <coughs> What's going on? Pretty bad, right? Um, maybe neurological problems, neurological trauma, probably things going on there. So you said you're going to get your pen light and check the pupils and all of that. What does the diameter tell me? If it's dilating or not. If they're constricting, if they're dilated, right? All mm -hmm. of that. If they're, if they're equal. What does unequal pupils indicate? Brain pressure. Yeah. What? Pressure behind the eyes. Intracranial pressure. Increase the intracranial pressure. Could be somewhat damage to the brain stem. Just a number of things, right? Yes. Um, how are we going to assess the infant, um, yeah, the baby? How are we going to assess them neurologically? Awesome. The, would you take reflexes? Very good. What reflexes do kind of indicate that um, neurologically there? Yeah, kind of, okay. The Brzezinski's, Brzezinski, how do you say that? Brzezinski probably could be one, but it identified like three right. reflexes. Moro and then was one. the Moro, the one where you the shake them, the Babinski's. Um, tonic neck was another. Turn in the neck. Tonic neck mm -hmm. was another one, or fencing and withdrawal. Um, those were kind of like the three that they said that they kind of like assist in the um, infant. And because you know it's difficult, you know, we can't talk to them, we can't ask them things, we can check the pupils, you know, things like that. But that's kind of like what the motor, motor skills there. Mm -hmm. And like motor skills really tell us a lot, right? Movement, things like that. What else um, are we doing? Level of consciousness tells us a lot. Yeah, um, vital signs tell us a lot. So we check the oxygenation, right? Mm -hmm. um, ultra saturation is going to tell us a lot. Um, the infant, as you said, the fontanelles, right? The bulging fontanelle mm -hmm. tells me what? <laughs> Increase in intracranial pressure. What else? Hydration or not hydration? That's the sunken. The sunken is dehydration, right? Yeah. The bulging fontanelle tells me increasing in intracranial pressure, but something else that we'll be talking about today. Meningitis, right? Have a bulging fontanelle with meningitis. But also, like, if the baby's like follows your voice, would that also? That might would help, depending on the age. Yeah, uh huh. That's good. If they would, you know, if they could, you know, things now, like that. I know that. they don't see very far. Right, uh huh. They don't see very far, and um, they maybe could, you know, and you may even get some automatic movement, you know, right? They could be kicking and things like that. It just depends. But we're just saying, you know, it is quite difficult. So what are some things that the physician is going to do um, for that patient? What type of isolation are they on for bacteria meningitis? Droplet. 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 Right, for the first 24 hours, and start those antibiotics, and then it should be, right, non-contagious. Non Sometimes we treat the family, yeah, prophylactically, whether they, you know, just because they've been exposed and the baby is positive. So how do we know if someone is positive for meningitis? Lumbar puncture. Look at the CSF fluid, cerebral spinal fluid tells us what? How should we like for it to be for no complications, clear, no problem? Clear. clear, yeah, very, very clear. <laughs> then if it's thick, thick, and it kind of like flows, if you have ever seen a spinal tap done, uh, when they insert the needle, it's very, very thick and cloudy, and it flows out very slowly, right? And it kind of just identifies, the doctors can tell you right then, you know, pretty much, but we are gonna send this for testing, right? <laughs> And so they test it and see how the glucose and the protein is in it. Generally, the protein is what? High. And the glucose is what? Low. Okay. And so um, then it also says what about with the white blood cells? It tells you just how many, you know, are present and things like that. And then what we do, uh, we do that culture and sensitivity on it, right? Because now we need to um, identify what the organism is, right? So um, what is the reason why we don't really see meningitis as much now? Vaccinations. So they get what? They have homophilus influenza B. 
beginning at what, two months of age, and then they have what, the meningococcal um, for the um, adolescents, they can um, possibly get that one as well, um, beginning at what, about 12, they can get that one as well. So the vaccines do help, um, right, with all of that. And then we'll go into different signs and symptoms, you know, that the infant child and the adolescent would present with. Um, so here, um, you'll do that focus assessment, and then it has all the different objectives that we will try to meet today, we should. Main things that we're gonna really talk about is cephalitis, meningitis, seizures, right? Down syndrome, may talk about amblyopia, um, strabismus, um, may talk about, um, gosh, what's the other? Cerebral Down palsy. Syndrome, cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I got five questions, but there me a lot of information here. We'll try to get through on time. So here, focus neural assessment. Definitely gonna get that previous history. What medications is the child on? You know, things like that. If they're on anything, you know, most of my children aren't on any medications. And uh, we definitely need to do this detailed assessment there. Um, Glasgow, coma scale. Could see that again. You need to make sure you, can, you know how to calculate. Um, and how many points are given for the different categories and the areas with the pupil's eye opening spontaneously and vice versa and things like that. So just make sure you, um, so that's an unaltered level of consciousness with a score of 15. And they can get anywhere from one to five points for each category. And then you calculate those. Eight or below, pretty much comatose state. And three is a deep coma, if that individual is. Um, almost maybe doing EDG, almost maybe about <coughs> dead, right, expired, things like that. Mm. And then it said children less than two years of old, it's quite difficult to identify, um, you know, doing the glass coast coma, coma scale, so I identified those three reflexes that they say. And then with the physical examination, with the family history, the vital signs and things like that um, will help us as well. They could have elevated temperature stated, um, as well, uh, may have a bounding pulse. Um, they could have a uh, deep irregular respiratory rate or slow respiratory rate. Um, and a lot of times uh, with meningitis, if it's not really treated with control, they can have seizure activity. Okay, I, we, okay. I got it. What are y'all saying? I didn't realize you were talking about meningitis. I didn't move I didn't catch the transfer. Okay. Yeah, I just blurted something out. Hadn't really got started for lecture yet. Just, just at the neuro assessment, I just named meningitis. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Okay. 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 Okay.
bolts anytime I'm talking about that. Not to need to be discussed there. So mature newborns demonstrate neuromuscular function by moving their extremities. And we just already talked about, you know, um, their um, reflexes and, and things like that. A newborn occasionally makes twitching or flailing movements of the extremities in the absence of stimulus because of the immature of the nervous system. So yeah, due to the immaturity of the nervous system, you know, everything is very, very immature at birth, even at infancy, and so development is still ongoing. And so that's why we have some of those problems there. Briefly, if you just look at the uh, reflexes there, but we've already identified the ones that we are talking about um, that are problems for the child. And it states that the Babinski reflex, uh, once we assess that, and then we say they're positive what? Okay, at least until three months of age. But in your book, what what is the age that it says that then we want to do further testing? Could be some developmentally delayed problems and things like that. Greater than what? One year, one year of age. Greater than one year of age, you have about if it has a positive propensity, then there's further testing to be done. A sleeping child should always be awakened for neurological observations. Um, and I guess that's just continuously sleeping, right? Um, infant or you see any unusual behavior that's not the pattern you know you know that they slept well throughout the night but then they you know still sleeping throughout the day um, less activity you know just a little bit lethargic things like that you definitely need to have them check maybe do um, check a temperature on them and mom needs to notify the pediatrician and or just bring them to the hospital to be evaluated because that's not normal right yeah. um, but the normal behavior of a child then is different you know, some child with the underlying disease process like cerebral palsy and things like that. That's different. But you know, you know that your child is not has not been diagnosed with anything then. So here we are on meningitis. And so it's inflammation of the membranes and the fluid space surrounding the brain and the spinal cord. And so, um, how does the infant present? Lethargic. Mm -hmm. Five lethargic. Do they have a stiff neck? Or the child. Mm -hmm. The newborn has like a well, weak cry. They just, they just can't move. Say that again. Now, what's the signs and symptoms for a child? I mean, for an infant. Weak Pretty much a high pitch cry. They have a high shrill cry. They're in pain. They have that bulging fontanel. And mom tells you that they're not feeding very well. They're vomiting, poor feeding, irritability. And they may even frequently have, begin to have seizures at home. What about the child? Child has some of the same ones. They complain of what? <laughs> Headache. Fever. Fever. The stiff neck. Stiff neck. Photophobia. Cannot touch the chin to chest. The ch if you touch it, it's very, yeah, it doesn't go there. Yeah. Um, I had an infection. Um, well, he's still, yeah, he's probably, he's moved way up now, but he um, really is over infection control. <laughs> And you would say, and um, I'm just laughing because it's funny. But um, he always, always, always will teach us something, you know, the nurses. That's why it's great to work in a teaching facility because you just learn so much, you know, and you see so much. And so he said, um, you know, if you ever think that you or whatever, someone's family member may have meningitis, just do your chance to chest, you know. And so frequently he would see me, yeah, I said, but my neck is hurting, you know. He said, Phyllis, it's probably just stress or you're tired or whatever, so, you know. And even now, you know, I'm still doing it, you know, occasionally. My neck is hurting. But um, it is Mine's a major sign for children. Right they could have some delirium, hallucinations, very, very irritable. They do have some vomiting as well. They may complain about um, chills, you know, things like that. Uh, we said drop in precautions, right? Have a decrease in the glucose in the CS fluid and increase in the protein, as we said. Uh, not that you really need to know that, kind of like above the scope for you right now, but you know, could see that you know later on. You are going to take the um, ATI for the comp predictor for nursing um, care of the children. You don't take a maternal newborn when they're level four, so it will help you. Students said that the pediatric lecture did, they remembered things. And then they did the focus review and they did well on it. So, And then we're hearing that the NCLEX is a lot um, on maternal child. So, you know, just keep that in mind because, you yeah. know. So, um, neonates are with a coarse sucking as well. Uh, poor tone, I think somebody said, um, you know, lethargy, things like that. They have the vomiting, diarrhea too. We you know the neonate is from what birth until one month. 
and then one month um, to one year is the infants. And we've identified there. Um, and so here you just see all the symptoms there that we're kind of like, you know, we put together. Um, double vision or the diplopia, um, photophobia. What is the Koenig sign and the uh, Brzezinski sign? Uh, physician does that. He's assessing uh, pretty much the child. Uh, probably be difficult to do on an infant, but you got to be able to differentiate what what is what is he doing when he's assessing. He's assessing they will be positive for both Brzezinski and the Koenigs, right? If they have meningitis. So what happens when he's assessing uh, for Brzezinski sign? Stiff neck. Mm -hmm. Severe stick, stiff neck, uh, neck stiffness. And what does the stiff neck do? Cause the, hips, the, the hips and knees to flex, right? Yeah. Flex up um, as the neck is flexed. Okay. So he's assessing the neck, right? Mm -hmm. And he's probably just telling the child if you know they're age appropriate, or he's doing it himself. If and, it, it, and as it flexes, then yeah, automatically. That's an automatic withdrawal. So the neck. The hips and the knees are flexed. Okay, that's Brzezinski's. So, what is current sign? How, do, how is the client? Laying supine. Uh -huh. Supine on their back, and you do what now? Flex the thigh. Uh huh. Okay, that's pretty much pretty correct. Um, flex the thigh. So that it is at a right angle to the trunk, and then they completely extend the leg at the knee joint. Okay, like immediately. Yeah. And so that's a positive sign for Kernigs. Um, positive Kernig sign for meningitis. Okay. So he is going to be assessing both of those. That's something we can assist the physician with, or the healthcare provider. But that's not what a nurse does, right? Everybody understand that. Okay, so we do have the different types of um, meningitis. We have the bacterial, and we have the aseptic or the what, viral. Um, do not um, really treat that with antibiotics. Um, they put them on IV fluids. We carefully monitor them, and we'll do whatever it deems necessary, and it pretty much subsides you know, over, over a period of time uh, on its own. Um, and we are more concerned, right, about anybody having meningitis but the bacteria, right? Mm -hmm. It's really, really um, life-threatening, can be. And the younger you are, yeah, the more susceptible you are, or more prone to um, major things happening, <clears throat> um, severe brain damage or death, you know, if we don't get the baby to the hospital in time and maybe we're just trying. That's why parents need to be taught to not try to treat the fever, just treat the fever, you know, or overlook that the child has a fever and things like that. and. Um, then it's really something else going on. And then now the infant or whatever begins to seize. Um, Neisseria meningitis, another, not the homophilus influenza, um, it, it causes the extremities to become very, very necrotic. And so we had a child and he lost a few toes of the infant. Um, I don't know, they lived in a very rural area. And um, you know, I don't think that's a reason for that, but um, the mom just felt like she could take care of the fever, you know, and things like that. But that's the type of meningitis that he had. And it's very, very severe. I mean, he really could have just had necrotic areas, you know, everywhere, but it was just really on a few toes. Um, he was in an intensive care unit for a very long period of time. Um, <laughs> even with the Haemophilus um, influenza, be they're in there at least three, four weeks, you know, on, on at least three or four antibiotics. Cephalosporins, um, that's the type of antibiotic that is used most of the time because it really affects and um, kills the bacteria within the CSF fluid very well. Um, so they'll be on any type of cephalosporin, cephataxin, and it's uh, several others. You don't really have to know the name of cephalosporin, but the drug of choice that we try to use. Um, you may even get to see the info with a peak line. Um, you may have to have a peak line, and, or we just may have to just keep, you know, starting re restarting IVs on them as well. Um, but now we're trying to put peak line in in uh, most patients who require, you know, that number of weeks of antibiotics, and you know that they are hospitalized throughout the whole time, so then they can compromise the family and um, financially, and however, um, so have to be mindful of that as well. So those are just showing different pictures of how the signs and symptoms there. It's just a chart that you all can review on that one anytime there. So um, we said that we are preventing, yeah, by vaccination. Um, have a pneumococcal vaccine as well. 
um, out. Um, they do that CT scan, lumbar puncture, the diagnosis, lumbar puncture is pretty much the definitive diagnosis. Um, and how the nurse assists with, and I kind of like describe how we're holding the infant, you know, um, for the position, um, the better technique of holding um, kind of helps ensure that the position does a really good stick in that area that he should. Sometimes yeah. we put emlocrine in that, in that area um, to numb that area if we have time. Um, but if it's, you know, very something very fast and things like that, um, we will not. But, you know, we just try to, whatever we can to decrease pain for a child, we do that. You know, that's just our goal uh, because we really hate that they're even having to be hospitalized. So Decadron, um, the steroid of choice, dexamethasone, um, um, anti-inflammatories to yeah. help with the inflammation, um, swelling, you know, the meninges and all of that. It's going to help um, with that a whole lot. Um, there are intravenous fluids. They may have several IVs. They may have a couple of IVs. Um, infants, you know, less than one year, even maybe two years, will probably be in intensive care unit for a while. You know, at least a week or so to get them stabilized and then they come to the floor. But they're just really making sure, you know, because PICU nurses, you know, they have one or two patients. So um, these are critical um, patients. And so when they come to the floor, they still want to make sure that the nurses are educated and they're going to, they, you know, you may not have as many patients as another nurse based on the acuity level of your patient, but you may still be very, very busy. Because giving three antibiotics within a 12 hour shift is, is pretty busy. That's a busy patient with other things going on, possibly with that baby. You're, you're very busy, you know. And definitely, if they have peripheral IV, and we got to restart them and things like that. So, um, going to treat the dehydration, um, preventing shock and seizures. And so, we don't want any seizure activity, but sometimes it does happen. So then, now we have them on um, some anti-seizure medication. They have them on Ativan. Um, they have to treat them, you know, just a little bit, you know, before even prior. I mean, going home on something just for you know a time period until the physician, pediatrician does the follow-up appointment and things like that. Because um, it can be pretty bad, you know. But we do have to alert and try to tell the parents that we think that this is the only reason that your child is having the seizure activities due to the, um, the meningitis, you know. And um, yeah, we are gonna probably do an EEG and look at everything there, tracings and, you know, identify what type seizure and things like that is occurring as well. And so they can't come in with just a febrile seizure. Sometimes um, babies are coming in just with the elevated temp, 103, you know, things like that, and have a febrile seizure based on that, but they have meningitis, you know, or they have sepsis or things like that. So um, you're going to do your frequent continual assessment. You know, you're probably in that room on the floor every two hours, if not more than that. That's why really they if you are having to be in a client's room that's on the floor greater than every two, I mean, less than, more than it, um, every two hours, they really, that's a patient that need to be transferred. Sometimes you really have to talk to the physician, sometimes you have to talk to your nurse manager to get that patient off that floor before. And then the main thing is that the patient's condition is going to decline, right? And they are at risk for having, you know, coding. Um, so that's our goal. We want to keep them safe on the floor. Sometimes we're understaffed. And, and we don't have enough nurses to do with, and that patient has such a high acuity level, or you have two out of there. You may, you have an oncology patient as well, you know, and you're giving chemotherapy as well, plus you have this patient, but you got three more, you know, so just make sure you are the advocate for yourself and your clients, and in those situations, you gotta try to reroute it. It has to be rerouted some kind of way. Sometimes a nurse manager will come and take a couple of your patients, you know, and take care of them for a while until you can get those stabilized. So here we're doing everything. We want to protect the patient from injury related to seizure activity. So we can have seizure precautions implemented. We can have the bed, the side reels padded. We can have suction at the bedside. O2, pulse oximeter. We can do everything, right? Um, as much as we possibly can, and we're closely monitoring them. And we're gonna keep that temperature down too if they came in with febrile seizures, you know, but then they're diagnosed with meningitis. So now we're probably doing the Tylenol, Motrin, alternating. Prevent any complications associated with immobility. You rarely see any children with pressure ulcers or anything like that or any skin breakdown based on that. You know, because generally they're what in the client in the parent's arms or parents in the crib with them holding them or things like that. Um, infection control is very, very important and they will uh, make sure that you're implementing that because you know, for the first 24 hours they're very, very highly contagious. And so in a situation like that, um, visitors, children, you would kind of like really put some emphasis on that because that's major, you know, and nobody should want, you know, their 
someone else's child to develop meningitis because you still don't know how it would affect them. It could be you know even worse for their baby or whatever. Provide supportive care, you know, of um, parents. What is meningitis? You know, it's a big word, different word, mm -hmm. you know. And then we tell them inflammation, you know, infection within the brain and, and all this and that. Then they're really alarmed, you know, and thinking, wow, are they going to survive? You know, you know, what's the prognosis? And so we haven't seen, I haven't seen, you know, any cases where they, you know, the prognosis was poor. Um, not, not any, really. Um, I thought that was poor when the child came in and he had, you know, the necrosis. That was about the worst that we've had, you know, to lose some toes, but he still was alive and, you know, doing well and things like that and, you know, tolerate the treatment. And he was there for, you know, a month or more, but that was been about the worst, but I haven't experienced, um, you know, any type of demise, like, Expiring. So our priority with meningitis would be antibiotic therapy. Mm -hmm. IV antibiotic therapy. They're using on triple antibiotic therapy. The steroid they'll probably be on. They're on the IV fluids. We're gonna monitor procedures. We're gonna monitor the fever. Um, all of that, keeping them safe. Um, strict intake and output. Probably NPO for a while because they're vomiting. You know, until we get the vomiting and all of that. Um, diarrhea resolved. You'll see a little uh, a change in a couple of days, probably. So it just depends, you know. <coughs> Doctors rather make them nothing by mouth, put them on IV hydration than handle the child just vomiting after every feeding, even though you're feeding them, you know. Um, parents don't sometimes don't like it, but yeah, that's the best thing. So we got to attack that organism, and we're treating it with the antibiotic. We started the IV um, quickly, and we want to keep them safe from injury. Definitely want them to have seizures, and we want to definitely monitor and keep that keep them a febrile is the key there as much as possible. If we want to educate, you know, make sure we adhere to our isolation and precautions and things like that. <clears throat> assessing the fontanelle, you know, assessing the vital signs maybe every two to four hours, just seeing how they're doing. There's nothing wrong with doing the, you know, perla. Make sure that they're okay, you know, documenting that. Oh, the detailed that. assessment. Yeah, Physician that. has ordered everything, CBC, <laughs> chest X-ray, <laughs> sputum culture, blood culture. We do everything on any infant and or child coming in with a fever, uh, ruling out everything, because it could be some other things going on besides the meningitis, but hopefully not. So anybody got anything on meningitis? Encephalitis, tell me about that. It's a viral infection. West Nile. Mosquitoes. 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 infections. West Nile virus. Things like that. Scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, scary. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So direct invasion of the central nervous system by post infections, um, involvement of the central nervous after a viral disease, just as we, you all see there. Um, West Nile, um, say it can be even a herpes, herpes virus, um, any type of inner virus can. Um, they could have fever. Um, they could come in malaise, dizziness, could have some focal seizures. Mm -hmm. Um, things like that can um, similar to but you know because we're gonna do the spinal tap right that's gonna identify what type what's going on no they don't have meningitis it's encephalitis right so they have the headache the fever the confusion um, it's a vector-borne rash that they probably will have you know identifying that it was that um, very very flaccid paralysis or flaccid floppy like may have some twitching Parkinson's like mm -hmm. movements as well so antiviral medication, IV acyclovir, um, very, very strong medication, probably need a peak line for it, tears the veins up immediately, um, they give it eight um, hours, round the clock, um, pretty um, strong medication, does the job, it does, and it could be on IV antibiotics as well and antifungal. So steroid of choice, been around a long time. De dexamethasone works greatly, works well, can have, and we want to prevent some of the same things that can occur as a complication. Dehydration, shock, and seizures. So
Why syndrome? Don't see it anymore. Why? We don't give aspirin. Um, as much. Oh, we don't give aspirin to our children. Definitely not. Um, so acute toxic encephalopathy or hepatopathy. Most cases follow a common viral illness. Um, so we educate our parents. Say no if they tell us, you know, but hopefully most of the time they are already um, educated on that. The parents must be reminded to avoid using both aspirin and non-aspirin containing salicylates during febrile illness in children. So successful management is early diagnosis and aggressive therapy. But we rarely see this because any of these, because of the immaturity of their system, systemic, um, their systems can um, be fatal, any of these um, at any time. You know, untreated, trying to take care of things at home, been home for a week, and you know, yeah. So, cerebral edema may have an increase in intracranial pressure. So, you may see the bulging fontanelle, most immediate threat to life. Um, but they also use an osmotic diuretic, diuretic, which is mannitol. Pretty much acts as a sponge, and that's been around a lot. So, you use that for adults as well to decrease cerebral edema. Um, mannitol, the osmotic diuretic. So seizures, now you guys know about seizures. I'm not gonna go over and spend much time on the types of seizures or anything like that, but I just wanna know how you're gonna take care of um, the two year old who's coming in with seizure activity first time, new onset seizures, and how you're gonna take care of them and prepare the room for the client. Bed the bed and the is being admitted. The bed in the lowest so possible. Bed in the lowest bed position. Real, Petted, room, padded, padded. Baby on the side. <laughs> yeah. Remove any toys or anything from the bed. What else? Suction. What else? Oxygen. Yeah. Oxygen. Post oximeter. Yep. Would be nice, right? Um, just most of Probably the medications that we give, um, we do give Valium sometime. Um, but Ativan is a drug of choice that we pretty much use. But it's refrigerated. It has to be refrigerated. It's a thick, thick gel. Comes in a little small vial. Um, but it's, it's great. Um, and so we can't have the medication at the bedside, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, we'll let them run and get it, you know, um, but we, so we won't be able to do that. So it's kind of good to have the medication. So we weigh them, we have the, um, well, they come in, we do the vital signs, weigh them. You know, you got your weight chart, um, um, everything, you know, there that you need. Um, monitor them closely, tell them mommy, we probably will be getting in here taking what vital signs maybe what, every two hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seizure activity, once a seizure occurs, then it could be even longer, even more often, right? Um, the main thing is to keep them safe, and I do not interrupt the seizure. No. Okay? Keep them safe, and I do not interrupt the seizure. Everybody know that. Fine. Right? Um, now, I've had them where they kind of like um, maybe just collapse and hit the floor. Maybe a child was just standing in the room. Then I got to grab the pillow and so, you know, place under their head, right? I can do that. But if they are actively seizing, somebody said, oh, yeah, I thought you took, no, you can't turn them. You can't do anything. You're not even supposed to be touching them, right? Um, if they um, have a seizure, if they vomit, if they are vomiting, I probably, that's another thing. Not only do I have suction, I got the yonker, right, connected to the suction. So if they're vomiting, I can try to, you know, to yeah. suction it out. Do but. that. Try. I can try, but I'm but not don't supposed turn to be in. interrupting. Everybody understand the seriousness of it because you can make everything much worse, okay. right? You can even cause injury. You know, just get mouth so bleed. Like not while they're seizing. Uh, yeah. Not unless they um, You can possibly when they're post ictal after the seizure sideline. It's, it's probably okay. But so just be mind. Just be careful with that. Yeah. You never interrupt the seizure. Documenting. documenting and yeah very good keeping up with time um, very very careful documenting the time that it happened um 9 45 um what what are they doing are they having a tonic clonic you know movements are they having twitching to the mouth is the mouth turning to the left are the eyes rolling back i don't know anything you know um do they vomit just whatever is going on you got to do a detailed doc documentation there Hand back here. So you said even if they are seizing and throwing up, you do not turn to the side. You don't interrupt the seizure. You can you can suction, 
but you don't because you're interrupting the seizure. I mean, I don't know if anyone has experienced anyone seizing. They're very, they're very saying, strong. Yeah. And they're yeah, they're doing a lot. And so you can yeah. It will almost be difficult for you by yourself. To I don't even, even know with you, you with your size and everything, Matthew. I don't even know if you could you see what I'm saying, successfully do that. Okay, so question two on the HDI test that you gave us, it says the nurse is caring for a child who is having a tonic chronic seizure and vomiting. Which of the following actions is the nurse's priority? The correct answer is position the child side line. Okay, so I want to ask Robert, that's ATI, that's a resource. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a resource. Somebody brought that question before. You probably won't see that, and that's not good. Yeah, you don't turn up. You don't interrupt a seizure. I mean, I think you all have had seizures. Y'all had mm -hmm. med surge, right? In the book, it says turn child to one side. Yeah. While seizing. Yeah, it says during the seizure, turn child to one side. You don't want to vomit in her mouth. I mean, you don't want them to aspirate, but suction because they're clamped down. Yeah. You can you can still. I mean, I mean you you're not in it. the mouth. You're in the you're in the oral mucosa to the side of the mouth. If they are you know constantly vomiting, but to turn what page are you on in there? Because I read on the seizure. Thirteen eighty. And it says if they are actively seizing. It says during seizure, turn child to one side. Okay, well, maybe that's a change in the book, but I just think that's quite unsafe. So what do you want to mobilize? I mean, is it age specific? Is it specific to the age? Um, no, it's not specific to the age. No, it's not specific to the age. If the book is saying you turn them to their side while they're seizing, then that's what you go by. Actively seizing. Actively seizing, yeah. Yeah, same. Been saying But if you probably, as a nurse, I'm not sure, working in a hospital setting, I don't know if you, yeah. Yeah, you Because it's quite, I don't know. I don't know how you can do that. But that's only once they puke. No, really, saying, but that's they, saying. They're having right. seizures, tonic clonic. So it's not when they're vomiting. So in the book, is it saying when they're vomiting? Or is it saying when they are having a seizure? It just says tonic clonic seizure. During the seizure, remain calm, time seizure. If the child is standing or seated, each child down to the floor. Turn child to one side, place pillow or folded blanket under the child's head, place in restrictive clothing, remove eyeglasses, clear any clear area of any hard uh, hazardous or hard objects, allow seizure to end without interference. And then it says do See, not. That, okay, they said allow seizure to end without interference, but you turned them to the side while they were seizing. So that's what I'm saying. You know, I'm just saying my pediatric experience, but we're going to go by the book. But you see how they end that? Yeah, don't Without interrupt it. You've already interfered when you turn them to their side while they are seizing. You're but you're, you're interfering, catching them because it's saying that they might be standing or sitting you're not up, so you're going to lay them down. You, just got the IV, you, give it, you have the IV, catheter, whatever, and you're pushing medication. You're not interfering with the seizure. You're not even, you don't really have to touch them, really. You just have to get what the JLU, right, and give them the medication. You're not interfering. But see, that's what I'm talking about. When you, that's why you have to read everything and then come to the period and say, wow, it's contradictory. That's contradictory. Because at the end, it said without interference. Really? Yeah. So, but because after it I'm all said. Saying, holding them down. I'm not sure why you're to holding them down like that. I think you're still interfering if, you, if my child is seizing tonic-clonic jerky movements, kicking, all this, and twitching, and you turn, I think you're interfering. You're interfering to me. But if the book is saying that, I've never done that. You know, what, what I was taught, and I used to be many years ago, and so maybe I didn't read that part on the seizures, but um, yeah. So go by the book. May I, yeah. just for a second, um, I think when they say do not interrupt the seizure, you don't go, Tabitha, Tabitha. Is she okay? Interference holding, holding can be defined many ways. It can be well, defined many ways. Right. I will say okay. to each individual person. To each individual. Yeah. But for you, but I don't know if you all have, the reason that you're saying this because you're students and I'm, I have nursing experience. If yeah. you probably was in the other way, you'll be like, really? How am I? Yeah. If we had been how doing it for a while, yeah. it would have been like, how are we right. supposed how to touch them? I? Yeah. I can't. Yeah. I've seen it, so I don't know how I would a even three, touch a child. You know, three, and it just has nothing to do with the age of the child or nothing. When they have it's those a person seizures, in general. Yep. they're very, very strong. But, so just go by the book. She was in the bathtub. Yeah. And they wouldn't have nothing to do. While I just let her do it. Yeah. So, okay. Pardon me? 
and she said, yeah. and, and was pretty much sitting up. Just give me one minute. <laughs> this. So um, the different type of seizures, everybody kind of like feel like they understand what they are, yeah, and things like that. Uh, what is the time frame? What are we saying is really major in time? Time is of essence because as I am seizing, what is going on? Brain cells are dying. <laughs> Lack of oxygen, <laughs> hypoxemia, that co therefore causes what? The brain damage, right? So time is of essence and it's very, very important for me to identify the time and how long, and I got to be specific in monitoring, you gotta been looked at the time of the clock that started, even though every mom is hollering, everybody's upset, because this could have been the first time the child had it, I don't know. Maybe they did this at home, she said, or whatever. Some can be from five minutes to 10 minutes to 30 minutes. Yeah, some can be for five minutes, they stop, they start back. So it's, yeah, it's quite alarming, you know, even for the nurse, even though you might have experience, it's still alarming. You know, you're like, wow, this is, yeah, this is a lot. You know, I need a doctor. I need somebody here with me, you know. Um, things like that. So IV access most definitely. Um, what medications do we give? Ativan. Ativan. And well, it's got to be refrigerated. Got to be refrigerated. It's all enough. Um, Ativan is given in the hospital only, right? It has a rapid onset. Um, they may give Valium. But I don't see children receiving value much. Ativan is, is a drug of choice. So um, if they have them at home, do they send them home with something like that? If, if they um, at home, um, just for um, they may um, send mom with a rectal value suppository that she can administer, and um, they do have buccal versed that mom may keep, give that at home as well. Um, but the child probably is on oral medication now. They're on phenobarbital to try to um, prevent it. Sprinkles, okay. phenobarbital and things like that. And then we're checking drug levels, you know, periodically and things like that. As the child grows and gains weight, then sometimes we do have to adjust to be the changed. medication because we see the children coming in season again, you know. So now the medication is not as effective and things like that. Um, what other medication did it say that we can use too? Um, diazepam. Mm -hmm. Value is diazepam. But well, what else can we use? What is it? Somebody saying something? Can you speak a little louder? Tiffany, what is that? Dot Lantern, yeah. My phosphenitone. We can use those in the hospital. Um, but the drug of choice primarily is the Ativan. But sometimes they are needed to receive um, the Dilantin as well or um, for even more severe cases and things like that. We may even give IV phenobarbital. Um, sometimes physicians really? give the IV phenobarbital and that's what they will go home on orally. So based on the type of seizures that they're having, what's causing the seizures um, and things like that, um, that's, that's how the, um, gosh, what is the type of physician? Um, the neurologist. <laughs> um, that's based on the neurologist ordering that for them. Um, <coughs> So we say that their status epilepticus when what? Seizure lasts is greater than what? 30 minutes. I heard five and I heard something else, 30. what? 30, greater than 30 minutes, right? Um, it's status epilepticus. How do we monitor or how do we administer that phosphenitone if we have to give it intravenously? It's very, very slow IV push. Mm -hmm. Um, and it says that it precipitates when it's mixed with um, normal saline. So sometimes what they say is that they flush the tubing. You know how you prime the tubing? Mm -hmm. So go ahead on and prime the tubing with what? Saline. Uh -huh. Saline first. And then so, and yeah. So it's not really compatible, right, in um, normal saline. Yeah. Yeah. What's but it said? works very well. It works very well. Um, and they even could be on dial oral dilantin, you know, mm -hmm. um, at home. So it just depends on the neurologist. He's done the EEG. He's monitoring the child. He's looking at what the nurses. Your nurses knows mean a lot. You see that man? And then he knows how many times he's been called through the night or whatever. The child is still seeing. You know, we've had some that just really out of control. You just could not control the seizure activity. And even the neurologist, one, he just said, I don't know what else to do. You know, I just don't. And, you know, so some of those situations are pretty sad. 
it's easy. I just really, everything, you know, you on like two or three, you know, medications. We have the medication Ativan. We pretty much give Ativan PRN as needed for seizure activity. We're not really giving Ativan around the clock, you know, just as needed if they have a seizure. Right there, it's a little bit so observation, very, very important, and documentation. So observation and documentation, we cannot say that enough. It's not on the camera. Um, the symptoms, the timing, before, during, and after. And so you with this patient for a while, right? It's post ictal. Got to get it situated. Maybe got to get clean them up. Give them a bath. Smudge grab. You change the linen. You know, um, maybe do some more enhance or you know. Implement the um, seizure precautions, talk to the family. A lot of times I'll go and print stuff, you know, give them something on seizures so they won't be so alarmed. Um, making sure you talk to the caretaker, nursing assistant about, you know, make sure you do this temperature this way and blah, blah, blah. Make sure this is accurate and things like that. Want to keep that temperature down so the doctor has the Tylenol and the Motrin alternating, and that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Especially if they came in with febrile seizures but we realize they have meningitis. We still got to make sure we treat that in our people. And we've had children that have come in before, you know, repeated with febrile seizures, you know. Um, just when that temperature gets 103, 104, they seize, you know. And so, so um, observe, document, nursing education during the seizure. Safety, prevent from injury. No child should be banging their head against the yeah. side rail unless that's a patient that was admitted with sepsis or something, I don't know, and they just began to seize. I mean, I had an adult that I, when I did a travel nurse assignment a couple summers ago, and I mean, no, he was not in for seizures at all. And I'm coming back to the room just to give him, and I mean, major, major, you know, face, facial twitching, you know, it was, whoa, it was, it was kind of frightening. You know, um, got the doctor, he happened to be at the other end of the hall, and he came in, but, you know, um, major, so we tried to get out of man as quick as we could. You know, he didn't have an order for it because he was anesthesia. So, um, not a stock drug on the floor, and he immediately got transferred. He made it back to the floor. I'm not sure, you know, I didn't take care of him after that, so I didn't know what the, you know, the wife was really alarmed, upset. You know, she's like, What is going on? You know, lasted for a while, it lasted for a while. So, uh, anyone has that type of, um, that, that's, it's quite, you know, frightening. It's, it's alarming. And, and the thing is to act, 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 you know? And so sometimes as nurses, we're not just ready to, you know, act so quickly all the time. But, you know, we have to. So status, epilepticus. epilepticus. Main goal, we got to stop. We want to stop that seizure activity. We want to stop that seizure. We know that, you know, time is of essence. The brain is continuing to lose oxygenation. And so, yeah, can be some, you know, um, after effects from the medicate, I mean, from the seizure, you know, things like that. All right, you can take a break. Okay, then I'm not worried about it. Then. Thank <laughs> you.